Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. Chapter 11. Speak Your American. The year is 1942. Henry stood in front of the mirror, examining his school clothes. He'd asked his mother to iron them, but they still looked wrinkled. He tried on an old Seattle Indians baseball cap, then thought better of it, combing his hair yet again. Anxiety about Monday mornings was nothing new. In fact, it normally began on Sunday afternoons. Even though he was used to his routine at Rainier Elementary, his stomach would not up as the hours passed. Each minute bringing him closer to his return to the all-white school, the bullies, the heckling, and his lunch duties in the cafeteria with Mrs. Beatty. This Monday morning, though, his ritual of serving the other kids seemed downright exciting. Those forty precious minutes in the kitchen had become time well spent since he'd get to see Keiko. Silver lining? Indeed. You won big smile this morning, Henry, his father commented in Chinese, slurping his juk, thick rice soup, mixed with diced preserved cabbage. Not a favorite of Henry's, but he ate it politely. Henry took slices of preserved duck egg out of his own bowl and set them in his mother's before she returned from the kitchen. He liked the salty slices, but knew they were her favorite, and she never saved much for herself anyway. On their dark cherry wood table sat a lazy Susan used for serving. He spun it back to its original position just as his mother was returning, her bowl back in front of her. His father's eyes peeked over his newspaper. The front line headline read, British Evacuate Rangoon. You liking your school now, huh? His father spoke as he turned the page. Henry, knowing not to speak Cantonese at home, answered with a nod. They fixed the stairs, huh? The one you've fell down? Again, Henry nodded, acknowledging his father's Cantonese, and kept eating his thick breakfast soup. He listened to his father during these lopsided, one-way conversations, but he never talked back. In fact, Henry rarely talked at all, except in English to acknowledge his advancing skills. But since his father understood only Cantonese and a little Mandarin, the conversations came as waves, back and forth, tidal shores of separate oceans. Truth was that Henry had been beaten up by Chaz Preston on that first day of school, but his parents wanted him there so much that not being appreciative would have been a terrible insult. So Henry made up some excuse, speaking his American. Of course, his parents didn't understand, imploring him to be more careful next time. Henry did his best to respect and honor his parents. He walked to school each day, going upstream against a sea of Chinese kids who called him White Devil. He worked in the school kitchen, as White Devils called him Yellow. But that was okay. I'll do what I have to, Henry thought. But along the way, I think I'm tired of being careful. Finishing his breakfast, he thanked his mother and gathered his books for school. Each had a newly wrapped cover, made from folded jazz club flyers. After school that Wednesday, Henry and Keiko did their work duties, emptied the trash in the classrooms, pounded erasers, then they waited for the danger to subside. Chaz and Denny Brown were responsible for retiring the flag each day, which kept them around a little longer than usual, but it had been thirty minutes since the final bell, and they were nowhere to be seen. Henry gave the all-clear to Keiko, who hid in the girls' restroom, while Henry scouted the parking lot. Except for the normal janitorial crew, he and Keiko were typically the last to leave, and today was no different. They walked side by side, down the stairs, and past the naked flagpole, dangling their book bags beside them. Henry noticed Keiko's sketchbook, the one she'd had in the park, in her book bag. Who taught you how to draw? he asked. And draw so well. Henry thought, with just a hint of jealousy, secretly admiring her talent. Keiko shrugged. My mother, I suppose, mainly. She was an artist when she was about my age. She dreamed of going to New York City and working in a gallery, but she has pain in her hands now, 
and doesn't draw or paint as much, so she gave her art supplies to me. She wants me to go to college at the Cornish Institute on Capitol Hill. That's an art school, you know. Henry had heard of Cornish, a four-year academy for fine artists, musicians, and dancers. It was a fancy place, a prestigious place. He was impressed. He'd never known a real artist, except for maybe Sheldon. Still, they won't take you. Keiko stopped in her tracks, turning to Henry. Why not? Because I'm a girl? Sometimes, Henry's mouth was too big for his face. He didn't know a delicate way around the subject, so he just said what he was thinking. They won't take you because you're Japanese. That's why my mom wants me to apply there. To be the first, Keiko kept walking, leaving Henry a few steps behind. Speaking of my mother, I asked her what owai deki tu ureshi desu means, Keiko said. Henry walked a step behind, looking around nervously. He noticed Keiko's flowered dress. For someone who appeared so sweet, she sure seemed to know how to needle him. It was Sheldon's dumb idea, he said. It was a nice thing to say, Keiko paused, as if looking at a group of seagulls swooping by overhead, then looked back at Henry, who caught a glint of mischief in her eyes. Thank you. And Sheldon. She smiled and continued walking. As they approached Sheldon's usual corner, there was no music, no crowd, and no sign of the sax player anywhere. He normally played across from the Rainier Heat and Power Building, its entrance still covered in sandbags from bombing jitters earlier in the year. Tourists walked by as though he'd never existed. Henry and Keiko looked at each other, wondering. He was here this morning, Henry said. He mentioned his tryout at the Black Elks Club went well. Maybe he got called back? Maybe he'd landed a regular gig with Oscar Holden, who Sheldon said had regular practice jams on Monday and Wednesday nights. They were free, so a lot of people stopped by and played or just enjoyed the music. Henry stood on the corner, looking up at neon signs marking the jazz clubs that lined both sides of Jackson Street. How late do your parents let you stay outside? He asked, looking at the horizon, trying to find the sun hidden somewhere behind the dense, overcast haze of Seattle's waterfront. I don't know. I usually take my sketchbook, so until it gets dark, I guess. Henry looked up at the Black Elks Club, wondering what time Sheldon might be playing. Mine too. My mother does the dishes and then relaxes, and my father settles in with the newspaper and listens to the news on the radio. That left Henry with a few hours. Still, evenings could be a dangerous time to be walking the streets. Since so many drivers had painted their headlights blue or covered them with cellophane to comply with blackout restrictions, accidents, either head-on collisions or people simply being run over crossing the street at night, were on the rise. Seattle's thick fog, which slowed down traffic on the streets and made trouble for the ships sailing in and out of Elliott Bay, had become a blanket of comfort, hiding homes and businesses from phantom Japanese bombers or artillery from suspected Japanese submarines. It seemed like there was danger everywhere, from drunken sailors behind the wheel, Japanese saboteurs, and worst of all, his own parents if they caught him. I want to go, Keiko insisted. She looked at Henry, then up the street toward the row of jazz clubs. She brushed the hair out of her eyes, looking like she'd already made up her mind about a question he hadn't even asked. You don't even know what I'm thinking. If you're going to go listen to him play, I'm coming with you. Henry thought about it. He'd already bent the rules by spending time in Nihon Machi, so why not head up Jackson and see the sights? Maybe even hear the songs? It would be okay, as long as they weren't seen, and as long as they made it home before dark. We're not going anywhere together. My dad will kill me. But if you want to meet me at front of the Black Elks Club at 6 o'clock after dinner, I'll be there. Don't be late, Keiko replied. He walked with her through Neon Machi, the route they always took. 
Henry had no clue how he'd actually get into the Black Elks Club. One, they weren't black. Even if he replaced the button he wore with one that said, I am Negro, it wasn't going to cut it. And two, they probably weren't old enough. Although, he thought he'd seen entire families, young kids in tow, go inside. But that was only on certain nights. Like bingo night at the Bing Kong Benevolent Association. All he knew was that he'd figure it out. They would listen from the street if they had to. It was only a few blocks over. A little farther for Keiko. But not too far. Close to home but a world away. From his parents' world, anyway. Why do you like jazz so much? Keiko asked. I don't know, Henry said. And he didn't, really. Maybe because it's so different. But people everywhere still like it. They just accept musicians, no matter what color they are. Plus, my father hates it. Why does he hate it? Because it's too different, I guess. As they reached Keiko's apartment building, Henry waved goodbye and turned towards home. Walking away, he watched Keiko's reflection in the side mirror of a parked car. She looked over her shoulder and smiled. Caught peeking, he turned his head and cut through the vacant lot behind Nichibi Publishing and past the Naruto Yu, a Japanese sento bathhouse. Henry couldn't picture bathing with his parents the way some Japanese families did. He wondered about Keiko's own family and what they might think of her sneaking out to a jazz club, let alone to meet Henry. He felt his stomach turn a little. His heart raced when he thought about Keiko, but his gut straightened all the same. In the distance, he heard the faint sound of jazz musicians warming up.